Welcome. Today we are going to take a look at for loops. Last time we looked at while loops, had some had some fun with that, did some neat stuff, and now we're gonna, you know, ramp ramp it up a little bit with the for loop. So last time we looked at while loops, and now we're gonna take a look at the for loop. So the general idea with a loop is that it repeats a block of code as long as there's something true, as long as there's a condition that's true. So a couple little you know examples I've got here. As long as I'm hungry, I'm gonna eat something. You know, you, you get the idea. As long as there's something that is true, I'm going to continue to do something until that condition is false. Here I've got just a little pseudo code. Uh, this loop's going to execute if my condition is true. The condition is if the student's hungry, they're going to eat more pretzels. You know, just a silly little example to kind of get the point across. And so a loop is a it's a tool used to repeat a repeat a block of code. As long as condition is true, that block of code is continually executed. So now let's get into the syntax specifics of Java with the for loop. So we've got this condition, and the condition is going to be executed as long, or the code attached to the condition is going to execute as long as the condition is true. So with a for loop, which is a little different than a while loop, with a while loop you had while and a condition and some code statements, and somewhere you had an increment, decrement, and somewhere you had an initial starting value. With the for loop, it has like places already set inside for you to put the pieces. Instead of it being kind of free form with the while loop, this one, everything's a little more concrete. So with the for loop, you've got your initial value. That's where you declare your variable or whatever it is you're going to loop uh, use for the loop. Whatever your condition is, and then whether you have it going up or down or whatever the case may be, your increment decrement, you got some braces and some code. Okay, so here is a basic for loop. In green, I've got the start, uh, that chunk right there, that section in front of that first semicolon happens exactly one time. You could call that zero or start or however you want to refer to it. And then your stop, which is in red, that's the, as long as that condition is true, it's going to continue to execute. In five, in this case, would be our stop value. It's going to run as long as it's less than or equal to five. And then in blue, we have the increment decrement. And then inside, we have a print line just to print out the loop variable so we can kind of see what's going on. So start happens once. As long as the condition is true, it's going to keep repeating, and the stop value essentially determines when it should stop, and the increment decrement is how, how much the variable will change by each time through. So this loop would print out 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, and it would stop whenever A plus reached the value 6. So in some languages, they're set up the way that I did that prior example, right? They're defined. The, there's a start value, a stop value, and like a step, which is kind of like your increment. Visual Basic does that. Visual Basic may be kind of old, but, you know, I used it a long time ago, and it had like a really nice setup on the loop, which kind of was easy to follow. And, and Java does the same thing. So anyway, here's another example. This one, I've kind of taken everything out except just the start, so we can kind of look at that independently from everything else. I've got int run equals one. That is my starting value. Run gets defined and set to one one time. So that's kind of your pre-loop uh, initialization, right? I kind of refer to that as zero. And then my condition check is one. As long as that's true, it then goes to two. Once it executes the statements associated with two, then it goes back to three. After it hits three, it goes back to one. If that's true, then it goes one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three until the condition at one fails. Once the condition at one fails, it no longer goes and does the stuff associated with two and three. Okay, so here I took the start out just so we can focus in on the condition. The condition is as long as runs less than or equal to five, and the stop, the stop value would be five. So in the prior example, we initialized it to one, and you continue to run through until that until that condition fails. And here I've isolated just the increment decrement section, which is in blue to the far right. And there that, that makes the loop variable go up by one for this case. And in here we have another example. I've just, I've just cooked up another one for you. Now our variables run, starts at one, goes up as long as it's less than or equal to six, increments by one. And the question is, how many times does this loop run? Well, let's find out. It runs six times. It will fail whenever runs value is what? Correct, seven. So once it reaches seven, it fails because seven is no longer less than or equal to six. Here, what I did that I think is kind of interesting, and I'll do this when we get to the code example. I basically took the for loop apart and basically set it up the same way that we did with the prior video where we were working with while loops. So I took the zero part, the initialization out of the front of the for loop before that first semicolon and put it above the for loop. I left the condition in, 
which would be exactly the way you would see a while loop set up. And then I took the increment decrement and put it below the print line inside the loop. So I basically tried to take the for loop and restructure it so that it looks and functions like a while loop. Because if you're very comfortable with the while loop, it's important that you understand what the pieces in the for loop are doing. And if you can kind of deconstruct it, take it apart, and then put it back together again, I think it makes a whole lot more sense as to what the different sections of the for loop are actually doing and why they're there. So this is just one of those little trivia things. A lot of people don't think about doing this, but for me, I think it helps me as well as other people that are just trying to learn loops understand how it's all, how it all fits together and what, what all the pieces do. And so here's what the output would be. In the next few slides, I've just got a couple different examples. One of the th reasons I did this one is so you could see that you could put more inside the loop than just printing out the loop variable. I can put some strings in there. I can put a whole bunch of different things in there depending on what I'm supposed to do with that program. So this one prints out comp plus the loop variable each time through so you can see that you can do more than just the variable output. Here's same thing. I've got a string with my loop variable mixed together so you can just see a little bit more. It makes it a little more interesting. Why is this a log to n loop, right? This loop goes up by powers of two. That would be why it's a log to n loop. Right, so 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32. You'll learn more about log 2n stuff later on. Not really in CS2 or CS APA, sorry, but down the road you'll learn more about that. So loop summing, this is one of the things that you commonly do with a loop, is you go through the loop and you total up, you sum up all the values of the loop variable, or you sum up all of some other kind of value. That's that's pretty common. Pretty common that you see in, in a lot of computer science classes and on the AP exam where you have to go through the loop and total up all the loop variables. Same thing here. I made a nice fancy chart. At some point you need to get a piece of paper and sit down and work out tracing out a loop. We did this with the while loop video where you list out all the values of X, list out all the values of total, and either list out each incremental output or whatever the final output will be. All right, let's go out and take a look at some of these examples in actual code. Now it's time to actually break this down in code. So this example that I have here, my start is 1, my stop is 20. So as long as A plus is less than or equal to 20, essentially when it gets to 21, it's going to stop. I'm going up by 2. And so when I run it in the output in the console, you see 1, 3, 5, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 17, 19. Let's change this to increment by 5 and run it again. And when we run it this time, you'll see we get 1, 6, 11, 16. We could also change this start value to, say, 7. We could run that again. Now we get 7, 12, 17. So what you need to do when you're trying to make sure you understand how all this works is go through and do what I'm doing. I'm going to change my loop stop to 5. If I do that, it's not going to execute at all, right? Because initially it's going to say, hey, is 7 less than or equal to 5? It's not, so it's going to shut down. I could also change this to a great big number, like 999. I could come in here and I could change this to 50. I could do a whole bunch of crazy stuff with this if that's what I wanted to do. So it all depends. Uh, this increment could also be a decrement, right? So I could say A plus is minus 10. This would create an infinite loop because my A plus value would be going down. It, it wouldn't, it'd be kind of sort of infinite. It would loop around for a long time before it eventually determined that it needed to, to stop. So anyway, we'll call it an infinite loop, close enough. But if I set my my change of my loop value to a net minus 10, then it, the loop variable would be going a different direction than my condition. My condition would be looking for a value to be increasing. Here, my loop variable would be decreasing. So let's do what I was doing in the slides. Let's turn this into a while loop. I think this will demystify the entire process for me, one of the things I like to do is I like to take something that's fairly complex or something that looks complex and break it down and make it a little less scary, if that makes sense. So in this case, it now looks an awful lot like a while loop, right? I've got my condition. I took out the initialization. I took the start out. And I also took out the increment decrement. And by taking them out, I put the start up here right here's still my stop where it's going to be checking my condition and then down here at the bottom I've got the increment decrement if I could type that would help okay so now I'll get rid of all this stuff so now basically what I did is I broke down the for loop 
into a while loop. And so now I can run this. Let me change it back to where we can actually make some sense out of it. Otherwise, it's going to run. It's going to run for about 500 days going in the wrong direction. So let's run this through. Now I get 717. You, you see in the output window. But basically, it's doing the same thing as a while loop. The only difference is that it, it's a for loop. I just took it apart. So I could take this and come back in here. This should work unless I've lost my mind. I can get rid of these two semicolons, and now I have turned my for loop into a while loop, which I think, to me, this is one of the coolest things you can do is where you take the for loop and you break it down, and you put it into a while loop, and people go, whoa. You know, it's just like, you know, I didn't know you could do that. But anyway, just kind of shows you what the different pieces of the for loop are doing. And so we could now go and put it all back if you want to do that. We can go back. Oh, that's not. There we go. I can put it all back. Now I'm going to take this initialization, this start, and I'm going to put it back in here. Put my semicolon back. I'm going to take this out just to make it a little easier to follow. I'm going to take my increment decrement. I'm going to put that back in here. And now I'll just rerun it now that I reconstructed it. So I basically took the while loop and put it back as a for loop. I put all the pieces back in their predetermined areas and I run it again and I'm looking good. So this initialization happens one time. The condition happens each time it iterates. If that condition is true, it executes whatever's inside. After it executes that, it comes back up to the uh, increment decrement and runs that. So I think this gives you a pretty good idea of what's going on. I'm trying to think. Oh, one, one of the other things you can do that I think is kind of interesting that, you know, maybe I shouldn't tell you, but I will tell you, is you can add an additional variable into the initialization, right? So if I want to use two variables in my for loop, I can define in this initialization section more than one loop. I can also come in here if, if I want, and I could say now if x is less than... 100 and then out here I could say X plus plus or whatever it is that I was trying to do right and if I could type plus plus that would help but I can add multiple variables in here I can do some pretty interesting stuff with my for loop if I want to do that and so it may not be something you need but it's kind of a neat thing to do all right hope this helped anyway I think if you can sit down and take the for loop apart turn it in a while loop put it back it'll help you better understand how each of the sections works at this point should have a pretty good pretty solid understanding of what a for loop is and how it works and what the pieces mean as we took it apart turned it into a while loop put it back we should we should be in pretty good shape so in this example i have the string comp side and my loop starts at zero goes up to the length goes up by one what i want to do is use this loop to access each of the characters in the string one at a time so you can see in the output it prints out all the letters one one at a time each on a separate line caret as you remember from when we talked about strings, if I give care at a position or a spot, it will give me back the character at that particular location. So every time I changes as it goes from zero to one to two, I use that variable value in order to access a particular character. So once I reaches the length of the string, my loop stops. As long as I is less than the length, I get the next character and get the next character and so forth and so on. But remember, we're using care at here. We're getting back characters. In this example, we're essentially doing the same thing. The only difference is I'm using substring. I'm using substring to get one character at a time, except when I access that character, I get it back as an actual string versus an individual character like I did with caret. Both loops are essentially doing the same thing. They're accessing each character one at a time for whatever purpose that may be. And we're going to look at how, how we would put this into practice in just a second. Now I have a bonus slide. This bonus slide is using a for each loop. This is something that we're going to break down in great detail down the road. It's just kind of a quick introduction, kind of like a little trivia item that you can look at. It's not something you're going to need to use right now, but down the road, it'll, it'll definitely come in handy. In this example, I got two bits of trivia, right? I got the for each loop, plus I've got the two care array method. I still have the same string, string s equals comp psi. And in my for each loop, I say s dot two care array. Two care array basically takes comp sign, turns it into a character array. We haven't talked about arrays yet. That's coming down the road too. So that's actually three pieces of trivia, right? Two care array, the four each loop, and character arrays all at once. So you can just disregard this slide if it gets too confusing. Yeah. So I convert my string into a character array, and then I pull one character out of that character array each time through and basically put that character into C, and I print it out. So it's doing what the other two slides were doing. 
except it's a little more interesting, right? But it may be something you're not that interested in yet. When we get into arrays and array list and some of those things, we'll break this down way more and it'll, it'll make more sense if it does. Just a bonus slide that you can use as you see fit. Now here, here's where we're trying to start building an algorithm. This is a string manipulation, string processing algorithm using a for loop. Here I've got a string with some value in it. it could be a parameter to a method, whatever that, whatever that may be. My loop looks just like the loop that we've been, been dealing with on the prior three slides. And then now I have an if statement uh, incorporated with it to do some kind of evaluation. And then I have a variable that I'm incrementing, right? So I go through the whole loop. Say I'm looking for the letter A. I check each character in the string. If it's an A, I bump up my count by one. So I'm iterating through the whole string. I'm checking a condition. If that condition is true, I'm going to do something based on that condition, whether it's increment of value or whatever it may be. So now let's go out and look at an example where we can actually build this algorithm to make sure that it's totally clear what's going on. Let's look at a string algorithm now that we have all the components or a string processing algorithm now that we have all the components kind of put together. So here I've created a method called search. I pass in a string and I pass in or I pass in two strings, my, my string that I'm going to examine and then LK would be what I'm looking for. So I've got my STR and I've got LK. I want to go through STR and see in some way does, S, does LK exist there or whatever the case may be. So I've got my standard for loop. I've got an if statement that says LK dot equals my substring. I have to use equals because I'm comparing, I'm comparing a letter that I started with that's a string to a letter that I'm pulling out of the string. If I was using caret, I could just do two equal signs for what it is for the, for the same idea. In this process, I'm dealing with strings, got to use dot equals. If I was just dealing with two characters, I could use equal equals. Anyhow, the, the unit where we went over uh, strings in detail, comparing strings with compare to and equals, you can go back and look at that if you're a little bit unsure of the difference between equals and equal equals. So anyhow, we'll talk about that more down the road too. So I've got my standard for loop. I've got an if statement where I'm checking something and then my count plus plus is what I do based on my condition being true. And then at the end, I return count. So I this, this could be anything, right? I don't have to just be looking for the parameter I was passed in. The parameter I was passed in could be any kind of evaluation that I'm trying to, you know, accomplish. But the main idea is typically if I'm doing some kind of string algorithm, I'm going to have a for loop or some kind of loop, could be a while loop too, and then I'm going to have to have something that I'm evaluating, whether it's some kind of equality check or, or whatever it may be. I'm going to have for loop with an if statement with a condition and some type of action that's created by that condition. So I'm passing in kitty cat and K and I get back to say I pass in zero. I want to know how many times the character zero exists in kitty cat. And now I run it through and I get back zero because there are no number zeros in kitty cat. I could come over here in kitty catty and put three zeros at the end, run it again, and now it's going to come back three. So it's looping through my STR, which is where kitty cat or kitty catty zero 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 is going and it's looking for LK within that string in this case LK was zero so you should be able to take this example and there's a bunch of the labs a bunch of the for loop labs that involve string manipulation and so this is just something you need to know for just general practical purposes uh, you know for the AP exam and just for you know demonstrating that you understand how a for loop works this is a great way to do that by manipulating a string. We're going to do the same thing when we get to arrays and array lists. We're going to loop through the array and the array list and examine the components, make changes, you know, add stuff, count stuff, depending on, on the exact specifications. Hopefully you enjoyed the uh, look at for loops. We did some really cool stuff. We took the for loop apart, turned it into a while loop. Also threw some bits of trivia in there for you with the uh, two care array and the for each loop. And a couple of those things, those are like, you know, high level top secret stuff. So if you're going to use that, use that at your own risk. That's, you know, you know, you got to be real careful with great power comes great responsibility. So anyhow, hopefully you enjoyed it and yeah, you can go back through this video and go back through the example several times if you need to. But now that you uh, have this all under control, it's ready to go out to the labs and crank out some code.